<laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Big amount of excitement today because we have motherfucking Joe Dante on the show. Where do I even begin? Joe Dante is a crucial and iconic horror director, most commonly known for directing the Howling and the Gremlins movies. His filmography spans from the 70s with his directorial debut, Piranha, which he did under Roger Corman. And fun fact, Piranha 2 was directed by James Cameron and also his first movie. His filmography also includes The Explorers, Inner Space, The Burbs, Matinee, Small Soldiers, and many more, including my favorite segment from the Twilight Zone movie. Today, Joe Dante is producing Camp Coldbrook, a found footage thriller about a group of ghost hunters with a reality show who visit an abandoned summer camp that was the scene of a gruesome murder. Joe also recently partnered with Trailers from Hell regular Josh Olson to launch a new podcast called The Movies That Made Me, where the two sit down with actors, directors, and producers to discuss the movies that shaped them into horror cinephiles. Now, let's talk about Gremlins. Gremlins was my gateway horror movie. I saw it when I was very young, and it was a fun and kind of gentle introduction into the world of horror at a young age. Nowadays, I'm not sure if it's because kids have become softer, but legitimately scary kids' movies are few and far between. There's not a lot of them. I grew up on The Witches and Something Evil This Way Comes, Monster Squad, Little Monsters, all of which had legitimately frightening moments. Even Ernest Scared Stupid, the Care Bears movie, and part of Who Framed Roger Rabbit have moments that are really shocking for little kids. These movies gave us just as many scares as we could handle, which both toughened our resolve and paved the way for a future passion in horror cinema. Eli Roth seems to be bringing this notion back with his latest film, the house with a clock in its walls. One of my favorite things to do is to rewatch movies that I loved as a kid and see if they still work as an adult. Having recently rewatched Gremlins, it's an incredibly well-balanced movie when you really think about it. Not to mention the amazing Gremlin creature designs by Chris Wayless. They're the perfect balance of highly expressive cartoonified caricatures while being deeply rooted in familiar biology. The markings, patterns, colors, skin textures all look very similar to what we'd actually find in the animal kingdom on reptiles and amphibians, which is why they look so tangible and believable and one of the reasons why the movies worked so well. Despite the haters, I even like Gremlins too. No, I love Gremlins too. It's so bonkers and so hilarious, and it takes the whole story to my hometown of New York City. Plus, there's a bat gremlin, a spider gremlin, a girl gremlin. There's that smart gremlin who talks on live TV and is hilarious. There's a vegetable gremlin and even a phantom of the opera gremlin. Honestly, what more could you ask for in a motion picture? Like many other great writers, directors, and producers, and actors, Joe Dante worked for Roger Corman, and we get into the lessons he learned from the Corman School of Filmmaking, and we get into Joe Dante's advice for aspiring horror directors, right here on the Nick Taylor Horror Show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's the legendary Joe Dante. <laughs> Joe Dante. Thank you for being here, sir. Thanks, Nick. So let's talk about Camp Coldbrook. How did this project come about? Well, uh, I spend, uh, spend a lot of my time um, in this business uh, looking at movies, obviously. And yeah. um, I was very lucky in that I got, a, I got my start with Roger Corman uh, in, a, in a different era, in a different business. But um, uh, it's always seemed to me that people who finally get somewhere uh, owe it a little bit to try to help other people um, take a step up the ladder. And uh, in this case, uh, my um, uh, my my office uh, is um, staffed with people who are movie buffs, mm -hmm. and um, Mark Allen, who is uh, was started as my assistant. Um, Found this project uh, called Camp Colbrook, and uh, Andy was the director, and um, Daniel Harris I knew from um, doing an episode of Erie, Indiana with her, uh, and Courtney Gaines is in it, and I worked with mm -hmm. him, and so it it just sort of seemed like uh, an interesting project for us to to 
get together and try to produce because one of the things that you do when you have a company is you don't just produce things that you direct, you mm-hmm. produce things that other other people direct. And I went to summer camp and I know how creepy it can be. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so this is a it, this haunted summer camp idea, uh, which dovetails into a reality uh, TV show um, mm-hmm. plot in which these ghost hunters are seeking out this supposed uh, events of uh, a now closed camp uh, for their big show that's going to save their series. Um, it just seemed kind of up my alley. And um, I was not a very hands-on uh, exec producer in the sense that I helped them raise some money and um, went over the script and uh, looked at the rough cut and looked at the dailies and all that kind of stuff and consulted as a, basically the way I would want it if it was me. Right. Um, just to have somebody, uh, as, I, as I did with Corman and Spielberg, I mean, just have people who know, know movies to be able to tell you, uh, maybe you should try this, maybe you should go this way, maybe, right. you're, maybe this is a, not a good idea. So you were a real mentor figure to the director. Basically, it's minds. a mentorship thing, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, this is not the first movie I've done in, in that way, but um, I think it's certainly the most commercial. Right. And um, the response has been good, and I like the movie, which is important, because if you're going to go out and sell it, you, you have to be able to say that you approve of it. Yeah. And, you know, my dictum is that uh, when I look at jobs that I want to take, I have to decide whether it's a movie I would go see. Right. And uh, in this case, um, I would go see this movie, mm-hmm. and uh, even though I didn't direct it. Right. It's funny that you mentioned Roger Corman, because I was going to ask about him, and what was it about Corman that enabled him to launch the careers of such a prolific amount of people. And it seems like nowadays, um, Jason Blum is doing something similar. A lot of people who have been working for Blumhouse are are going and doing their own projects. And what I've heard from some other people who have worked for Corman is the sense of empowerment that he gives people is very tantamount to them being able to go out and make their own films. He was able to empower them, but also the Corman way of doing things, just everybody was able to learn everything. Yeah, I think that Blum is definitely on the Corman uh, root and um, uh, has been very successful in a, in a somewhat more compressed time than Roger was because Roger did this over a longer period. Right. Um, but he did have an Roger had an ability to attract um, people who really were dedicated uh, to finding a way to get into the movie business. And uh, when you look back on the names from Coppola to Scorsese right. to John Sayles to, you know, all, uh, the, the litany of people, Jonathan Demme, who, who all went through the Corman School um, and went on to big mainstream careers, uh, you see that his eye for attracting um, talent was really pretty remarkable. I mean, there were, there were a number of people who went uh, through the Corman School and, and didn't have the drive or the talent or whatever to go further beyond that. But for the most part, it's it's a pretty amazing group of people. Yeah. And and uh, at a certain point, I think the, the, the backbone of the Hollywood industry in the late 60s, early 70s, ended up being uh, people who were trained by Corman. Right. And it's true, he did... He was very money conscious, obviously, and uh, wanted to be able to sell the movies a certain way and make sure that there were certain exploitable elements in the movies. But he bankrolled some pretty odd movies. I mean, he's, he, 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 Monty Hellman worked for him quite a bit and right. made a series of uh, some rather odd, arty westerns um, right. for Roger that no one else would have ever bankrolled. And sometimes Roger didn't even put his name on the picture. His, his name is not on targets, even though he was the, the producer of it. And that was the picture that, that uh, made Bogdanovich uh, into uh, a, a celebrity director. And is also, um, to my view, the best movie he ever made. Um, and that continued through the 60s, 70s, 80s. And you know, then the home video business came out and Roger right. got into that. And now the movies, instead of going to drive-ins, they were going to, uh, to video. Uh, and he is at 92 still working and still wow. making movies and still finding new talent. Right. That's pretty extraordinary. You had said in John Landis's great book called Monsters in the Movies that monsters are metaphors. And there's a, there's a real renaissance with horror right now. And obviously, everybody knows that the horror industry seems to go up during times of social unrest. Hmm. As in a metaphorical sense, other than Get Out, which is the big shining example, have there been any other recent examples of horror movies that you think are properly kind of doing justice to the whole monsters as metaphor idea well i i i wouldn't 
put it quite as bluntly as that, that, uh, that all horror movies are metaphors with monsters in them. But the, the, I think given the times that we're in right now and the uncertainty of uh, even the form of government that we have been living with for so many years is now seems to be uh, on the brink. Um, it's certainly not surprising to me right. that there would be a lot of horror films. I mean, in the 30s, the 40s, the war years, the Vietnam years, there's always horror movies and, and, and it, 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 not just exploiting people's anxieties, but, but making social comment. Right. And, you know, yes, Get Out is an obvious social comment, you know, movie, but then so is um, so, uh, Sorry I, what's that? I can never remember the name. Sorry to Bother You? Sorry to Bother You. Right. Uh, which is the, the least memorable title I can think of because <laughs> I can never remember the name of the movie. But it's, 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 a, it's a fairly remarkable movie and it's a movie that could only speak to these times that we're right. in right now. Uh, and when you see the movie, you'll see specifically why that's true. Um, and, uh, you know, are things going to get better? They often do. Um, but I don't think there's going to be any abatement in the uh, onslaught of, of horror films. They, they, are, they have traditionally been the most reliable box office performers. Right. Um, partly because their audience is young. And some of them are young enough not to even know that they've been seeing the same story over and over and over from ge for generations. Um, but it's a loyal audience. Right. And as you can see here in Monster Palooza, uh, it's, a, it's a very highly commercialized audience. And, and you know, there, there, there would be no Comic-Con right. without horror movies. Um, it's not just superhero stuff. It's, it's the, I, the whole idea of the supernatural and, uh, and, 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 and trying to find life uh, lessons in events that are, you know, not strictly normal. Yeah. And uh, right now the period that we're in is, I think, fair to say, not strictly normal. <laughs> now that is very safe to say. So having worked with some of the greatest special effects makeup artists of all time, like Rob Bottin, Steve Johnson, Chris Wayless, Stan Winston, in this day and age where CGI is very, very overutilized, how important are practical special effects to you today? Well, very much so. I mean, uh, CGI is a great tool. There's no doubt about it. And I think most people are unaware of exactly how much manipulation there, there is in movies that they see. Things right. that, that are normal, mundane things that they assume, oh, that blue sky is nice. Well, it's not a real blue sky. Right. Um, but as far as using practical effects, I find that uh, they, while they have their limitations, um, there's a reality to practical effects that it's very difficult to duplicate with CGI, certainly as far as actors' uh, ability to relate to what's in the frame with them mm -hmm. uh, is, com is completely different with CGI than it is if you use a puppet or, a, or, right. or something on the set. Um, and I think also that because of CGI, if I did a picture called a picture like Gremlins today, uh, I would still want to use the practical effects that I did, but they would be much improved by the fact that you could now do a pass with the puppeteers in the frame, manipulating the puppet right next to it, and then do another pass and then remove them completely. This was right. not this was not possible uh, in the '80s or even the early '90s when we did the the Gremlins movies. That just wasn't a thing that you could do. Right. Um, so to me. Um, I think the fact that people have sort of started shying away from doing practical effects and practical makeups is, is a, uh, uh, it's a diminution of um, something that uh, people should be taking advantage of. Because, yeah. it, 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 you know, as, as the uh, society has changed and has, uh, as the tools uh, have improved... Um, they've improved on both sides. I mean, they've right. improved in CGI, and they've also improved on, in practical. There are things in makeup that you couldn't do, that you can do now, that you couldn't do before. Um, but to just sort of toss it all off and say, let's just push a button and have some guy on a computer do it, uh, I just think is, a, is, a, is not a smart thing to do. And, and also, the, the, the CGI material doesn't have the weight right. of actuality, of, of, of a photographed reality. Right. And um, I think it's it, it may someday get there, but we're pretty far along with CGI, and it, it's still pretty difficult to 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 watch those Hobbit movies and to see these tell. things, you know, these uh, the CGI vehicles and stuff moving and and feel that they actually are hitting the ground, that they right. actually 
have any weight to them. Right. Yeah, I think gravity you know? is the perfect way to put it. You can feel whether or not it's it's it was practical or not. Yeah. There's just something on some subconscious level. You just you just know. Yeah. Yeah. As far as gremlins, I heard you on postmortem talking about the inception of it and how, or when you were putting it together, you said it was, it's a wonderful life meets the birds. And for me, what makes a great horror movie is if you were to remove the horror element, would the characters be able to carry the movie? I easily could watch a movie about the Peltzer family and and the dad's inventions. Mm -hmm. And there was just such depth to all of the characters that were there. And the story was just so well balanced. You knew the horror element, it had some comedy to it. It was a very compelling family. It was just, I, it felt, I grew up on it as a kid, but watching it as an adult, in retrospect, it's such a well-balanced film. Was there any sort of formula you were attempting to strike? It, or was it calculated or did a bunch of things come together? How were you able to formulate? Well, I think a bunch of things came together, but I mean, uh, Chris Columbus wrote this script uh, entirely on his own as a spec script that okay. was not even intended to be produced. It was something that was like, let's show, the agent said, you know, write something that shows people what you can do and then we'll get mm-hmm. you some real jobs. And when Spielberg saw it, obviously he he, he sparked to it. Uh, and I think one of the reasons he sparked to it was because of the sort of William Soroyan treatment of the father as the failed inventor. Right. He's got a big heart, but, you know, it doesn't quite know what to do. And uh, when we were casting that part, um, it was so... Uh, Heart wrenching that we had we had a, 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 a actors like Pat Hingle who used to do Soroyan plays come in and play this part, mm-hmm. and he was so good that we couldn't hire him because he was so good. He was so good that we couldn't hire him because all of a sudden the movie was going to be about oh about how how, how Billy Peltzer's father can't make it right in the world right, and he was it was moving. I mean, he was this was great, and I, it's the first time I ever had to tell an actor, "I'm sorry, you're too good for my movie." Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so it would just completely overshadow the horror element and everything and else. So and so when we hired, uh, you know, uh, Hoyt, who was less of an actor than a singer uh-huh. and had a just a sort of an innate folksy quality, right? Uh, it's it cartoonized the character to a, a degree that was able to fit in into the ensemble. Yeah. Whereas if we had hired uh, Pat Hingle, it would have been a, a drama, right? <laughs> with the Gremlins in it, right? Now that makes perfect sense. Uh, the last few questions. As uh, as you, you mentioned before that you're a mentor figure, obviously, to a lot of aspiring directors, and you've been in the industry for a, lo- for a while, and you've seen it go through a number of different changes. As far as today's aspiring directors, is there any piece of advice that you think, particularly in this time period, directors should be aware of or do? Is there any, what would be your advice to aspiring horror directors today? Well, it's difficult because the business has changed so much since it started when I since I started on it and uh, the opportunities are um, there there are less of them and they tend to be cheaper right and you know uh, horror movies always been a good bet because you can make them for not a lot of money but um, to uh, to do a horror film on a low budget you have to prepare and you have to uh, be able to make decisions quickly. Mm-hmm. And you can't noodle about. You can't decide, well, gee, I don't know, should I put the camera here? That, that won't cut it. I mean, it, 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 the things that we learned at Corman, which were hurry up, you know, and don't congratulate, congratulate yourself after the next shot. You got to know what, you got to be two shots ahead. I think now you have to almost be a day ahead hmm. to know, to be able to, to actualize the stuff that you um have to do in order right. to get the movie made efficiently and efficient yes you have to have the talent and yes you have to have the drive but you have to be efficient and because nobody's going to hire a director who goes over budget on this low budget horror movie right so uh i i obviously seeing a lot of movies is good seeing what's been done before mm-hmm. uh, so that you have it in your arsenal is good but but you just can't go off and copy the things that you've seen you have to have an approach to it that's a little bit offbeat a little different and you have to be able to stick to it right and when people come and say well you know it's a little far out and you know i you, you got to say well that's really what i think is going to work here right because th- there are so many of these movies and they're all so similar particularly yeah, the slasher kind of movies that you that you really have to come in with something special and yeah. something extra and it doesn't have to be the human centipede extra <laughs> you know i mean it it, it, it i mean it, get out is not an expensive movie Right, uh, but it's uh, it's a it's a clever movie, 
and it's and it uses a lot of tropes that we've seen before in various things, but it puts them together in a in a new way, and that's really all you can ever do. You're never going to invent reinvent the wheel. It's, right. it's still what it is. It's a genre movie, but people go to genre movies to get certain things out of them, and they get disappointed if they don't get those things. But if they only get those things, then they're still disappointed. So right. you've got to be able to find a way to to manipulate the stuff so that it looks like it's different. Right. You have to deliver the goods, but also yeah. do something different. Great. Joe Dante, this was a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks. Big, huge thanks to Joe Dante for joining us today. So lots of great lessons in here for aspiring horror directors. Let's do a little recap. Number one, do things the Corman way. The Roger Corman ethic of low budgets, preparedness, and hustle combined with the unprecedented amounts of responsibility and autonomy that he gave to his directors was a magic combination that educated and empowered many of Hollywood's biggest success stories. Joe stresses how indie horror directors can't get precious about things like camera angles and lighting nuances when they're working on their first films. Instead, they need to always be two shots ahead of themselves and get their movies made efficiently. Talent and drive are simply not enough. Producers look for directors who deliver their films on time and on budget. A great book on the topic and an essential read for any filmmaker is Roger Corman's biography. It's called How I Made 100 Movies in Hollywood and Never Lost a Dime. You can get it on Amazon. It's gold. Get it. Number two, deliver the goods, but not just the goods. Horror audiences have expectations, whether it's for blood and gore, inventive kills, or jump scares, and horror directors have a certain obligation to deliver those goods, but the goods alone won't cut it. The storylines, character development, and tone and style of your projects can't be secondary, but need to be well thought out and unique. Properly doing this will boost the effectiveness of the horror element and imbue the movie with cinematic integrity. Gremlins was a well-structured story with very compelling characters who you cared about immediately. When they were threatened, we were scared for them, though some of us may have been rooting for the Gremlins. Give the audience what they want, but don't gloss over the details because it's the details that make the horror elements work even better. Number three, mentorship is everything. Always pay it forward. One of the great things about Joe Dante is that he's one of those people in Hollywood who's very grateful to be a part of the system. And he does what he can to give back to other directors. He's a real mensch in that regard. He frequently mentors other directors and takes them under his wing the same way previous directors like Spielberg and Corman did for him. Mentorship in this business is everything. If you need one, find one. And if you can be one, be one. Number four, live and die by your vision. So one thing I found fascinating that Joe mentioned was how he had to turn down Pat Hingle for the role of Billy's father in Gremlins because his performance was too dramatically compelling. Despite the quality of the performance, Joe knew that it would not mesh with the lighthearted spirit of the movie because it would have emotionally captivated the audience and made Gremlins more of a drama, which was not the intent. Having a strong, predetermined sense of the tone and focus of your movie is key. It enables you as the director to intuitively make casting decisions that keep the flow of the film cohesive and consistent with your original vision. Thank you, as always, for listening to The Nick Taylor Horror Show. If you're enjoying this, don't forget to subscribe on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts online. And if you really want to do me a solid, feel free to share this episode with your friends on social media. You can follow the show on the Instagrams at I'm Nick Taylor. That's I am Nick Taylor, T A Y L O R. Same handle on Twitter. And if there's someone you think we should have on the show, send me a message and let me know. Thanks again for listening to the Nick Taylor Horror Show. We scare because we care. Thank you.